Welcome to AP Chemistry and General Chemistry. I'm Jeremy Krug. In this lesson, we're learning about some applications of electrochemistry. Now, my channel has the entire AP Chemistry course, so don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already done so. I don't want you to miss a thing. Now let's get started. In this first example, we're going to be given several pieces of, of equipment here. We have uh, some nickel uh, ions, we have some copper ion solution, some aluminum ion solution, and we're given the corresponding metals, some nickel metal, copper metal, and aluminum metal electrodes, as well as a little salt bridge here, and even a voltmeter with some wires and clips on the end here. And the, the question is asking us to take these materials that are available to us at standard conditions, build a galvanic cell that has the highest possible E cell or the highest possible potential difference. So how do we do this? Well, let's take a look at the standard reduction potentials for those three uh, reduction half reactions. So if we have nickel being reduced or nickel ions being reduced into nickel, that's a negative 0.23 volts. Copper two ions being reduced into copper metal is a positive 0.34 volts and aluminum ions being reduced into aluminum metal would be a negative 1.66 volts. How do we make the galvanic cell or the battery that has the highest possible voltage here? Well, the way I would set this up is think of all these uh, numbers, these standard reduction potential uh, voltages here as if they were points on a number line. So I'm actually going to set up in my mind or maybe on paper an actual number line and, and I'm going to start plotting these. So we have the nickel a, a reduction is a negative 0.23 volts. I'm going to plot that. And then for the copper uh, a reduction is a positive 0.34 volts. So I'll plot that as well. And then we have the aluminum reduction is negative 1.66 volts. We have that right there. So to get the highest potential difference, we're trying to find the two elements for all practical purposes that are the farthest away from each other. Do you see what those are going to be? It's going to be the aluminum, which is right here, and the copper right here. Now this kind of gets to the crux as to what a standard reduction potential is. Whenever you take a look at this list of three standard reduction uh, potentials or that long list of standard uh, reduction potentials in your textbook or on a table that you might find, every one of those reduction half reactions can take place. However, the ones that have the more positive potential difference have a greater potential to occur. And as a result, they're able to push those electrons through a wire more effectively. Now, uh, in the last video series, in lesson 19, we said how ions or atoms can steal electrons. And when, they, uh, when you have ions that steal electrons, they get to be imprisoned in the solid state, as, as an example we had in, in the last series of videos. Well, these reduction potentials that you see here on the screen here, these, these voltage values, they actually represent how much force they exert when they steal those electrons from, or those electrons rather, from another atom or ion. So that's why we can say that this is kind of like a number line. If the uh, copper two ions, for example, encounter these aluminum atoms, the, uh, there's going to be a certain difference between those. And so the difference between those uh, uh, potentials would be the voltage that ends up on the, the voltmeter, and we'll calculate that here shortly. That's why we call this cell potential sometimes the potential difference, because it is literally the difference between those two points. It's the actual difference in the potential to push electrons. So that's what this is all about. Now, let's actually solve the problem now. We have decided that it's going to be the copper and the aluminum. So that means that we're not going to do anything with these uh, nickel uh, pieces here. But we are going to take the copper and the aluminum parts of that. Of course, we'll have to have a salt bridge and a voltmeter as well. Now let's calculate the cell potential. 
Hopefully you'll remember from the last video series that it's E cell equals cathode minus anode. So it's like this. And remember, E cell needs to be positive. And so we have to subtract these in such a way that we get a positive number. And the only way that's going to work is if we take 0.34 minus negative 1.66. That's the only way to make it positive. If you had them in the other orientation, you'd have a negative value. So if we do the arithmetic here, and we uh, essentially add these, it looks like the E cell is going to be 2.00 volts. So this is a 2 volt galvanic cell, assuming we're at standard conditions here. Now, the next thing it asks us to do is to write the cell equation. Now the cathode, remember that's where reduction takes place, and the 0.34, the, the copper is written as a reduction, so we don't have to change anything about that. But the aluminum, we have to change that uh, since it's the anode, it's the oxidation. And since it's written as a reduction, we have to flip it so that it actually is an oxidation. So we're going to flip that one just like this. Al yields Al uh, plus 3, plus 3 electrons. And now I'm going to add these two half reactions together. Now, can I add the half reactions as they stand? I don't think so because the electrons don't cancel out, do they? To make them cancel out, I have to multiply the first half reaction by 3, like this, and then I have to multiply the second half reaction by 2, like this. And now they're going to add up. The six electrons will cancel out on both sides. And so I get an answer of this. And I added the states in there as well. So we get three copper 2 ions in the aqueous state plus two aluminum atoms in the solid state will yield three copper atoms in the solid state and two aluminum ions that are aqueous. So that's how we write the cell equation. Now, let's take a look at what happens as the cell reaction progresses. And so remember, we started out this process at standard conditions. That's what the, the problem said on the very first slide there. So question one asks us, what is the initial concentration and temperature of all solutions when the galvanic cell begins to run? Well, remember, we start with standard conditions. That means 25 degrees Celsius and one mole per liter for any solutions. And so that's uh, the answer for that one. One molar and 25 degrees Celsius. It's just standard conditions. Now, how about this question? What happens to the concentration of copper ions and the concentration of aluminum ions as the reaction continues to run, or so as this galvanic cell uh, progresses? What, what happens? Well, this is just a simple uh, chemistry question, basically. We're just ta ta uh, talking about what happens as a reaction goes on. You know, copper ions, as we see here, on uh, the left side, these are reactants. And what's going to happen to pretty much any reactant as a reaction progresses? Well, it's going to be depleted, isn't it? So I would expect the concentration of the copper two ions to go down. And why? Well, it's a reaction that is pretty much a forward going reaction, and reactants tend to get depleted as the reaction progresses. Now, Conversely, what's going to happen to the aluminum ion concentration as this reaction goes on? Well, hopefully you know that products will tend to increase as the reaction progresses, right? And so aluminum is, aluminum is a product, so we would expect its concentration to go up as the galvanic cell progresses. And let's see if that's the right answer. And certainly enough, that is what happens. Copper decreases aluminum ions increase. Let's answer another question. What happens to the potential difference, the voltage of the cell, as the reaction continues to run? Well, this is kind of a common sense question as well. Imagine that you have a battery, just a regular battery that you put into a cell phone or a radio or a flashlight. What's going to happen to the voltage of that battery as you continue to run it as that flashlight stays on, for example. Well, I hope you know that the voltage is going to go down, isn't it? And slowly but surely, that flashlight gets uh, dimmer and dimmer. 
So the voltage, the potential difference, will decrease. It happens to your cell phone as well. You charge up your cell phone in the morning, and then as the day goes on, the percentage goes down, doesn't it? It starts at 100%, and by the end of the day, it's, it's getting pretty close to zero, very possibly, isn't it? So you have to charge it up. Uh, it would not make any sense if, as the day went on, the battery in your cell phone started going up. You'd, you'd think that there's something weird going on here, right? Voltage goes down. Potential difference of the cell will spontaneously decrease as things go on. The only way for it uh, to go up is if you, uh, you know, add some power to it uh, in another way. I'll actually talk about that in the next video. Now, here's another question that sometimes comes up. What happens to the galvanic cell when it attains equilibrium. Remember, equilibrium, and there, there is an equilibrium that could take place here. That's why I went ahead and put this in as a uh, double arrow, as you can see up here. What happens to this galvanic cell when it attains equilibrium? Well, remember, at equilibrium, the reaction hasn't stopped, but the uh, concentrations uh, are no longer changing. A galvanic cell at equilibrium has a voltage of zero. Or, as we often like to say, the battery is dead. So, generally speaking, galvanic cells at equilibrium don't do us a whole lot of good because they're dead, unless you recharge them after that. Um, if you go to the grocery store and you buy some batteries, and it says on the package that these batteries are at equilibrium. Do not buy those batteries because they're dead batteries. <laughs> you don't want dead batteries. You don't want galvanic cells at equilibrium. You know, eventually they get to that point, but that's uh, not going to be too useful to you in most cases if you're trying to generate electricity or power some kind of a load like a cell phone or flashlight. Let's take a look at this question here. We're going to use the same balanced equation. And we have that same reaction where it's standard conditions, just like we were before. But this time, we've run the galvanic cell. It says calculate the concentration of the uh, copper 2 plus ions when the aluminum ions have increased to 1.50 molar. Now, this is just a stoichiometry question. Uh, this is a, a non-standard cell. We don't have to use any fancy equation. Uh, there are some equations that help us to, uh, to talk about non-standard cells, but for AP chemistry, we try to keep it as straightforward as possible. This is just a stoichiometry problem. So I'm gonna actually going to draw a little ice box. We're not really gonna be at equilibrium. We'll call that end, you know, initial change and end in this case, because it's not equilibrium, it's not a dead battery. Uh, if you have forgotten how to solve icebox problems, then you might want to take a look at those in the previous video. I'll have a link in here that will hopefully appear on your screen as you're watching this. Now, once again, our initial concentrations are all one mole per liter because this is a standard cell. And standard cells always start at one mole per liter. But it also tells us that the aluminum... Now, after we've run the battery for a while, has increased to 1.50 molar. So I'm going to put 1.50 molar down here as the, e the end, let's not call it equilibrium, the end concentration of aluminum. And our job is to find out what's the end concentration of the copper. Do you see what we're trying to do here? We're just trying to, to set up an icebox and, and solve for the end concentration of copper. Well, hopefully you can see that the aluminum had to go up by 0 0.50. So that means that the copper had to go down by a certain amount. Now, by how much did it go down by? Well, remember, it's the coefficients of the balanced equation that tell us. If the aluminum is 2, Copper's three, it's a two to three ratio. So it's whatever three halves times 0.5 is, which I think is 0.75. That means that the copper ions go down by 0.75 molar, which tells us that the copper uh, ion concentration will have to be 0.25 molar. 
And so that's how we can solve for the unknown concentration when you have uh, a, a galvanic cell that's no longer its standard conditions. Now, let's take a look at one other set of possibilities here. Let's consider this very same galvanic cell, but this time we're going to ask how can we oh, I'll manipulate this. So what we're going to do is try to apply Le Chatelier's principle to this. Okay, so how is the potential difference or the voltage, the E cell, of this cell affected when the concentration of copper ions is increased? And so think about that. If we have you know, the copper ions going up, we're going to have more of those. In which direction will the uh, reaction be shifted? Hopefully from the Le Chatelier's, uh, video, uh, the Le Chatelier's principle uh, lesson, you uh, remember that by adding more reactant, copper 2 in this case, it shifts the equilibrium to the right. And so we're going to make more aluminum ions, but we're also going to make more electricity, right? Because that's basically a product as well. In fact, if it makes you feel better, I'm going to write plus electricity down here at the end. Okay, so if we add more uh, copper ions, it's going to shift to the right, and we're going to have an increase in our potential difference. So the E cell is going to go up. We're going to increase the voltage. Now likewise, what's going to happen if we increase the aluminum concentration? Think about that. If we're adding aluminum ions, then that's going to shift the reaction to the left, according to Le Chatelier's principle, right? Anytime we add a product, it shifts the reaction to the left. So that means we're going to make less electricity. So E cell would be expected to decrease. And in fact, that is what happens. You would actually decrease the voltage if you increase the aluminum ion concentration. How about this question? Let's imagine that we're in the business of trying to make more voltage, make more potential difference here. State two ways to increase the potential difference, the E cell, of this galvanic cell. Hopefully, you realize that our job here is to increase the E cell, increase the electricity that's formed. We're trying to shift this to the right. Can you see two ways to shift the reaction to the right? I can see two. How about increase the amount of copper ions, right? Anytime you, you increase a reactant, it's going to shift it to the right. We're going to increase the voltage. And how about if we decrease the amount of aluminum ions here. Because remember, anytime we decrease the products, we also shift equilibrium to the right as well. So we have those two ways. We can increase copper ions and decrease aluminum ions. And so here we have several uh, questions that are about the application of galvanic cells. Many of these involve galvanic cells that are not at standard conditions, where we've uh, manipulated something, maybe using Le Chatelier's principle or just our regular stoichiometry to find out what happens when we change something about the galvanic cell. Uh, once again, uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, if you learned something from the video, if you'd be so kind as to hit that like button, I'd really appreciate it. That way, uh, YouTube recommends my videos to other chemistry students. Like I said, my name is Jeremy Krug. I've been teaching AP Chemistry for multiple uh, decades, and I want you to get a 5 on your exam or make an A in your class if that's your goal. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again where we can learn some more chemistry together.